I think the SDGs are an advance on the MDGs. The MDGs were the invention of some technocrats sitting in an office in New York who, after the Millennium Declaration, decided it would be good to turn this declaration into some development goals. It was a good idea, but of course it was not involving people. I think many people in the uh, developing countries had no idea that the MDGs existed. <laughs> but anyway, it was a start. This, uh, these goals are different because we learnt a lot from the first 15 years and there has been a reasonably good process around the world of engaging citizens, engaging organisations, government, non-government, to talk about these. And what we have is 17 goals and I think that they're basically a good thing. Will they be implemented in the way that we hope? Well, that is the challenge. That is the challenge. And one of the things that worries me is that in the Millennium Development Goals, goal number eight was about a new partnership between all the countries in the world to, in order to deliver the other seven goals. And this was the one that least progress was made on. It was the one where we were going to reform the uh, financial system, the world trade system, uh, the, uh, the question of debt, uh, there was going to be uh, increased aid and predictable aid. There was going to be new finance made available to the poorer countries. Very little of this happened. And the seven goals were relying on goal number eight in order to be implemented. <laughs> and I feel that the rich countries got away with uh, being negligent on that issue. And now we have 17 goals. And the 17th goal is the same as the 8th goal. My belief is that the 17th goal should become the first goal. Because unless uh, this partnership develops and unless the resources are made available, the other 16 goals cannot be delivered. So in many ways it's the most important. And 17th goal is about resources? The 17th is about the sources, it's about a new partnership, and it's all the things that were in goal number 8 are repeated in goal number 17. So how can we avoid the same mistake happening again? That, to me, is the real challenge. Because the document, when I read it, is very beautifully written. Of course, the people who write these things, they have a way with language, and you know, they make it sound inspiring. And I think there's a lot of excitement in New York about this opportunity. I, today, I've been listening to people saying, this is a very special day, it's a historical day. And I have to say, as an Irish person, I'm quite proud that our government was one, uh, together with Kenya, chaired the process that produced the process, uh, produced the outcome. So for a small country of four and a half million people to do that, that's something we're proud of. But that's today. I mean, we're talking about 15 years. <laughs> so what's going to happen? And uh, it's about political will. Is there pol political will to deliver this? Uh, we listened to Pope Francis today talk in a long address, but ultimately he was also talking about political will. And he talked about the duties of politicians and of governments to do the right thing, to respect the dignity of all people. And he also said that, you know, these might be seen as goals, but they are essentially human rights. Every one of these goals is a right. It's not some abstract thing that we're trying to aim towards. It's what people need in order to live a dignified life. And uh, to, to change the, uh, the way governments have acted in order to deliver these is a big, big challenge. I was talking to some diplomats today, today who are involved in the United Nations, and they were saying that rather than being committed to these goals, there are some countries that are actually going in the opposite direction uh, by way of closing down civil society space, uh, as he said, tearing up the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This is the contradiction of this summit. I think we should rejoice in what has been achieved, but we mustn't believe that this is going to be easy. And for CPDE, this is our challenge. We are in a very strong position in that uh, in the uh, Busan Agreement of 2011, civil society was identified and recognized as an independent development actor with a right to a voice in the negotiations. And I think that those of us 
who have played that role in the various uh, working groups and in the steering committee have done it very well. Um, and I think we should continue to do this. But there's a question mark over the future of this role because the SDGs is purely intergovernmental. The United Nations is made up of governments. There's nobody else a member of the United Nations. Um, and the, uh, where we are at the moment was a creation of the OECD, that's the donor countries, together with UNDP and others. And now there's the question to be debated tomorrow about a new global partnership. What will be the role of civil society in that? And in the United Nations system, it is to be consulted, but not to contribute to policy. And when I read the, um, the 17 development goals, what they seem to me to be saying is, this is what governments, we governments, have agreed to do for our people. But I don't get a strong sense of, we will work with the people to help them to do these things for themselves. It's very much top-down. And, uh, of course, there's a, rule for, a room for civil society to implement projects in agriculture, implement projects in health and education, and that's a good thing in itself. But it's not enough, because what we want to hear is the voices of citizens uh, holding their governments to account, challenging their governments where they feel they're making mistakes. And uh, this, is, this is good citizenship. And what I find frustrating is the idea that governments find the idea of active citizens a threat rather than an asset. <laughs> now, in Ireland, um, I mean, we are one of the wealthy countries, so I realize it is different, but we got our independence from Britain. You know, we were colonized just like India was colonized and um, so it's nearly a hundred years ago now we were a very poor country when we were established and it's very interesting the role civil society played in developing Ireland. Well you know I think uh, we often see the glass half full or the glass half empty. I'm a half full man myself. Uh, we would have liked more but we have more than we had. And I think that's something to work with. And I think that with the, uh, the commitment and the energy of our civil society partners around the world, we can make something of these goals. Will we be happy at the end? We're never happy at the end because there are always people who will not make it. Um, that the, the, the theme of these goals are that nobody will be left behind. That's a big, a big challenge. And we must try and ensure that as far as possible that that becomes a reality. But I think hope is a very strong virtue. We often talk about faith, hope and love, and we talk about faith and love, not so much about hope. And hope is really about saying that no matter how difficult it is, that in the end it will be right. And I believe in the end it will be right.